One of the most unique and exciting things about life in wormholes is the ever-shifting connections. If you live in Jeta, then you know that Perimeter is always one jump away, but for those of us who choose to live out in Anoikis, every day brings a new adventure. You'll find new holes taking you in and out of K-Space. You might find a C1, a C3, a C13, and all kinds of different content available within them. This does come at a disadvantage though, because sometimes you do end up rolling into a system that is just useless and terrible, and it can be awful trying to go down a chain. Sometimes you come towards a wormhole to discover it's closing in on the end of its life, and you don't want to spend too much time on the other side of it. This is where rolling wormholes comes in, essentially the ability to collapse a wormhole by passing enough mass through it repeatedly, and in this video, I'm going to teach you how this works. Ahoy there folks, I'm Captain Benzie and welcome back to another Catskull Academy lesson for EVE Online. In this video, we're going to be talking about everything you need to know about rolling wormholes, what that means, how it works, how you do it, why it works, and why you'd want to do it in the first place. Now, I do apologise, this lesson is going to be fairly math-heavy. I don't intend to take you all the way back to secondary school or high school or whatever, but there are going to be a lot of numbers flying around. I will try to make it as simplistic as possible. I will slow down and try to use graphics on screen where I can. Now, this is a very important lesson for wormhole life as well, so you won't just find this video in the Catskull Academy playlist, but also in the wormhole life playlist. Essentially, if you're looking to learn more about EVE Online, check out the Catskull Academy playlist. If you're le looking to learn more about life in wormholes in specific, then check out my wormhole life playlist as well, because that will have loads of cool information. Now on my Discord as well, which is linked in the description down below, I am currently working on a complete primer to everything you need to know about life in wormholes, and this video is designed to twin with that. So come join Discord, make sure you head to the Wormhole Guide PDF channel, download the PDF, it'll be in the pins, and check out what that's all about as well. Our Discord is heavily themed around wormhole life in EVE Online, so definitely you can ask questions there. Now if you do enjoy this video or you find it educational, let me know, drop a comment down below with what you learned or what you like or anything you think I may have missed, and let, hit like on the video as well, it takes you a brief second and it really helps me in my content out. On the subject of helping me out, if you do want to go the extra mile, I have a Patreon page, a PayPal tip jar, and a Redbubble merchandise store where you can grab some exclusive merchandise, that all really helps support the channel and keep me making content like this. Every little helps. Thank you so much to everyone who does pledge to support and helps keep this channel going. Anyway, with all of that said and done, let's jump right into a Catskull Academy lesson talking about rolling wormholes. If you're watching this video, I have to assume that you've already watched my Wormhole Survival 101 video, and if you haven't, I strongly recommend pausing this video, going and watching that one first, and then coming back, because it will give you a bit more information about wormholes overall. For today, though, we do need to just quickly revise up on some of the wormhole information that you can get by right-clicking on a wormhole and going to Show Info. Notably, we need to look at its life, its mass, and its wormhole type. So here I'm looking at the PDF document I mentioned earlier, and again you can find this on the Catskull Discord for free download. Now looking at the image on the right hand side, at the very top you can see under wormhole information it says wormhole K162. Now those four digits, one letter followed by three numbers, is very very important as we'll see later. This is the wormhole type, we'll talk about K162s in specific in just a moment. We also need to know the lifespan of the wormhole. So in this case, we can see the wormhole is reaching its end of its natural lifetime, which you should know means fewer than four hours remaining. It could be three hours, 59 minutes. It could be three minutes. You do not know anything more than it is somewhere between those brackets. Then we have the mass text. In this case, we have this wormhole has had its stability reduced by ships passing through it, but not to a critical degree yet. Now that not to a critical degree means it's somewhere between 10 and 50% of its mass allowance, whereas it would say stability has been critically disrupted if it was lower than 10% of its remaining allowance, and it would say not yet disrupted if over 50% of the allowance was remaining. The nutshell explanation of rolling wormholes is essentially reducing the amount of mass that is allowed to go through the wormhole to the point that the wormhole hits zero and therefore collapses. It then 
disappears from space. And what this does depends on the type of wormhole that it is. Now, when I say type in this case, I don't mean like K162 or B274. I mean, is it a standard roaming wormhole or is it a static? So let's explain what those two things are first. Now, a roaming wormhole is a wormhole that can just open up anywhere, any system, any time. It can just appear. It can connect to all kinds of different places. It is what it is. If you collapse one of these, it is gone for good. It is never coming back. It will just it'll eventually wander through and a new wormhole may open up a few hours later, so on and so forth. Statics, on the other hand, are special types of wormhole connections unique to certain JSpace systems. So if you are in a JSpace system that, for example, has a high sec static, what that means is there will always be a wormhole connection to a high sec system. That high sec system will change each time a new connection appears, but th those connections will appear immediately. If you sit and watch a wormhole reach the end of its natural lifespan and close down, that wormhole could have led you to perimeter for example. That then collapses, and a new one, if it was a static, a new one will immediately open up somewhere in the system. You can then scan it down, warp to it, and it now might take you to Amar, or Corazor, or Heck, or Dodixie, anywhere that is a high-sec system. And the advantage of this is that you can theoretically roll a static. You can decide that I want to reduce the amount, I'm going to keep moving ships backward and forward, backward and forward, through that wormhole until enough mass has passed through to cause it to collapse, and a new wormhole is going to immediately appear because it is a static, and that could be better. It means if you are, for example, in a C1 system and you're looking for a high sec static to get to a good trade hub, you can sit there and say, well, my near nearest trade hub's 15 jumps away. You move a ship backward and forward, you collapse the wormhole, a new hole opens up that's only three jumps away from a trade hub. Much better for you. And so you can do that in order to re-roll where your connections go. This also applies to things like C3 or C5 statics. You might have your C5 static has been cleared of all content and there's nothing left to do in there. So you roll the wormhole by passing mass backward and forward through it and a new C5 static appears that could have significantly better content inside. That's one of the main uses for rolling a wormhole. We do also have what is referred to as rage rolling, which is doing that purely to see if there's anyone else on the other side um, and go hunting them. But we can also roll off wormholes. The wandering wormholes we talked about earlier don't immediately reappear. So when you collapse a wormhole by rolling it, it's gone for good. So if you're in a system that you think, oh, there's a lot of really nice stuff in here, we want to harvest this without being attacked, you can close off all of the wandering wormholes permanently. Now, as for the static wormholes in that system, this is where I said we'd talk a bit more about K162s and what that meant. Now, essentially, when a static appears, it is just the entrance at that point, the B274, the 0477, that kind of thing. It is just that. You can scan it down and it will still just be the entrance. But the second that someone lands on grid with that entrance, the K162 appears at the other end, wherever it was designed to go. Now, what this essentially means is, if you were to roll off all of your wandering wormholes, then close your static connections, as long as nobody warps to the new static connections, no one can get into the system, because the K162 has not yet appeared. It will appear after a few hours of nothing happening, at which point players can then scan it down and jump through, but until that point, your wormhole is completely secure. Only the people in it can be in it. There is no way in until you open the door and create the K162, or enough time passes and the K162 forms. But at that point, you just roll the wormhole off again and suddenly don't warp to the next static, and this is called hold control. That is hole control. This means you can lock down your wormhole and only the people already inside it are there, which means that JSpace can theoretically be safer than HiSec because you can just have a system that nobody can enter. And that's one of the major advantages of rolling your holes. Now, on the subject of different wormhole types, we've just talked about a K162, but what do all the different other types mean? Well, in my wormhole PDF, which is again available on the Catskull Discord for free download, you've got a full list of every single wormhole type and exactly what it means. The wormhole type itself will denote where a system comes from and where it goes. So for example, a B274, one of the ones I'm fairly familiar with, is a C2 to high sec connection. 
That means it will always start in a C2J space system and it will always end in a HiSec system. That is what that works out as. And an 0477 on the other hand is a C2 to C3 connection. Now, it doesn't mean that that's a static, it doesn't mean that it's a wandering. Both wandering and static will use these same four digit identifiers. So it's worth having this available because it can, uh, and learning these can also really help you figure out what is on the other side. If like me, you sometimes struggle with the visual identification, you can easily spot whether or not something is a zero, an 0477 and now, oh, you know that that's definitely a C3 on the other side, that kind of thing. The other thing that the wormhole type identifier tells us is the total mass allowed through the wormhole before it collapses and the individual mass of transit. Now, if we again look at a B274, we can see here on the left-hand side here, a B274 allows 375,000 tons to transit each jump. This means you can bring a battleship or things like that through as long as they are 375,000 tons or lighter. If we have a look at the total mass allowed, you'll see it has a total limit of 2 million tons. Now that means if you were to jump, say, a 200,000 um, ton ship through, it would reduce that hole by 10%. So do that 10 times and the hole will collapse, right? Now you're understanding rolling. There is one, however, one really annoying catch to this. The total mass allowed shown on this particular chart here is the average. It can be 10 percent uh, more or 10 percent less that makes things a little bit more spanner in the works for us so this b274 could be 2 million tons exactly it could be anywhere as low as 1.9 it could be anywhere as high as 2.1 million tons it's not a great place to be to have to sit there and work that out manually so when we roll a hole we have to do it with ships that we know can force that collapse at either way, and we will probably have a backup there to thread a hole, which we'll talk more about later, in the event that our math is ever so slightly off. Because remember, this is based on a hole being at, you know, brand new and fresh. When you look at a B274, you can't just accept that it's going to be 2 million tons. It could be 10% higher or lower, but also ships may have passed through it before you have, which means it could have been reduced. And since, again, we know that the text only tells us once it's reached the halfway point, the 1 million ton mark, Essentially, we only know if it's somewhere between 1 million and 2 million tons. We don't know where in that boundary it actually is at this point, and therefore jumping something could cause it to cross a boundary. Once it's at a million tons, it will we know it's at uh, destabilization, it's 50%, and that will then reduce all the way down to eventually 200,000 tons. 200,000 tons being the 10%, at which point it is labeled as critical. And so, we essentially are going to find ways to use that math. But essentially using this chart, you can figure out what the total mass allowed is, and you can plan either side for a little bit of allowance. So with that in mind, let's talk about how to roll it. Since the aim of rolling a wormhole is essentially to pass enough mass backward and forward through that wormhole to reduce it to the point of collapse, we need to understand how to even see that on the ships that we're flying. So here I'm docked in a Megathron. I've opened the fitting page and on the right hand side here under navigation, you can see the mass of your ship. Now in this case, the Megathron is 196,800 tons. That's pretty good. That's close to 200,000 tons, which for our purposes is going to be good enough. This is where there's an interesting aside um, in how micro warp drives and afterburners work that can come to our advantage here. If I simulate this fit, you'll notice that my mass increases all the way up to 296,800 tons, almost 300,000 tons. Why does that happen? Because the micro warp drive is now active and that 500 mega newton afterburner, uh, micro warp drive, sorry, is increasing our mass by a full 100,000 tons. What this essentially means is we have a ship that can be either 200,000 tons or 300,000 tons just by activating a different module. And I know that it's not exact, that 4,000 or 3,200 tons though is not much of a problem due to how the whole plus or minus 10% mass on a wormhole actually works. 
So how do we achieve this on a battleship? Does it have to be a Megatron? No, it doesn't. Praxis is another very cheap, very commonly used wormhole roller. Essentially, any battleship can do this. You're going to want to fit a Higgs anchor to this, a large Higgs anchor one. If we have a look through the attributes here, you'll see that this doubles the mass of the ship on its own. It also makes the ship ridiculously slow to move, so do be aware of that. Essentially though, we fit one of these to push our mass all the way here up to 196.8 tons, like megatons there. 196,800 tons, huge amount. We then fit the micro warp drive, 500 mega newton micro warp drive for that ability to activate it, you'll see there. We activate it 196,800 tons, goes up to 296,800 tons, thanks to that micro warp drive being active. So essentially, if you've got a Higgs anchor on a battleship and a 500 mega newton warp drive, you're ready to go. That is literally all you need at this point. Everything else that I'm going to talk about is essentially secondary. Now, I have been asked by Ashy of Ashy in Space fame just to point out that neuting rolling, putting neutralizers on rolling battleships is such a stupid idea. It never really works. It doesn't do anything. If you're using a battleship, you may as well fit actual guns to it and shoot at the things that are trying to kill you. Don't rely on someone coming to your rescue. Sit there and just kill the stuff anyway. That's why in this case you'll see here, I've got a load of guns on this Megatron. I've also added in some tackle there. We've got a grappler and a warp scrambler, just so that if anyone does try and get away from me as I've nearly killed them, awesome, I can you know hit them and punch them that way. The, the load of tank in the bottom there is because it's straight up buffer. I'm probably gonna be neutered. I may as well just sit there and try and survive as long as possible. It's worth noting though that we do also have a large micro jump drive. This is an incredibly useful piece of equipment. You don't have to have this on a rolling battleship, it's not necessary, but it does have some nice advantages. Because essentially what we're going to do is warp to our wormhole at zero, jump through it either hot, which means with the micro warp drive active, or cold, which means with the micro warp drive deactivated. We're gonna jump through that wormhole either hot or cold, and then we're going to have to jump back. Now, because these are such big, heavy, slow ships, you probably don't want to do the whole thing of slowly turn around and drift back towards the wormhole because even with the micro warp drive active, you'll see our navigation is a whopping 154.9 meters per second. And that's with pretty good navigation skills. It's gonna take you a long time to get back to the wormhole. And what happens if you've just polarized yourself? What happens, you know, we're jumping this wormhole back and forward repeatedly. You don't want to just sit on the wormhole. What you're going to do is once you've jumped through, you're going to warp off to a safe point you've already set up, wait there for the five minutes of polarity to pass away, then we're going to go back through and keep on jumping and so on and so forth. The reason we have the micro jump drive is if we land on grid and it looks like there's some tackle, we can spool this up, get away, turn around and warp to our safe point nice and quickly. It just gets us out if anyone tries to grab us. We can also use it to theoretically jump to a perch off the wormhole, but now I'm kind of complicating things. Essentially for a, what is referred to as a 300 mega Newton, uh, 300M or 200M roller, you just need a battleship with a Higgs anchor and a 500 mega Newton micro warp drive. It's really that simple. This is a wonderful wormhole roll control quick reference chart made by Algar Theosunt of Catastrophic Overview Failure way back in August, 2016. Now, I know there are going to be some people frantically typing on their keyboards the moment that I show this, saying, oh, it's not entirely accurate, you shouldn't be sure. I'm well aware, but it does give an excellent starting point for pilots who are just trying to figure things out, especially if you're looking at some of the easier and more common holes, which tend to be the 2,000 holes. Now, this is where the math gets a bit confusing because some people use the full ratio of the tons, some people use these gigagrams, which is, uh, it's, yeah, it's awkward. But essentially, this does work. This 2000 gigagrams works nicely with the concept of a 300 or 200 ship, like a battleship, because you can see that you're, rather than trying to take off 300,000, you're just taking off 300. We've reduced this by a thousand in order to make the math a little bit easier to work with. So we know from looking at that chart earlier that our B274 is a 2 million ton or 2000 gigagram 
wormhole, right? That's its mass allowance. And again, that can be plus or minus 10% either side. So we could be 2,200 gigagrams. We could be 1,800 gigagrams. It's nice and confusing like that. But if we are to use a 300, 200, uh, hot roller, um, battleship, sorry, rolling battleship, we can essentially follow this chart. We arrive on the hull for the first time and we have a look. First of all, is the hull reduced? Is it still showing us healthy? If it's showing us healthy, do two cold jumps. That's jump into the hull without your micro warp drive active, warp to your safe point, turn around, come back so you're at zero on the hull and jump back out again with the micro warp drive deactivated. That is what cold means. Two cold jumps followed by two hot jumps with micro warp drives is the hull reduced. Now I would actually add into here, you need to be checking every time you jump. When you jump, check the hull behind you. Is it reduced? This kind of suggests that you should just do two cold and two hot and then have a look at it. No, don't. Do two cold jumps, two hot jumps, but check between every jump. The second the hull hits reduction, that's the 50% boundary, we go into the second phase of this. We now need to do two cold jumps and two hot jumps, assuming we're on the correct side of the hole, because remember, we're doing this with even numbers. That kind of means that, you know, if you're if you want to be in system A and you jump into system B and the hole collapses behind you, you're in, you're not where you want to be. If it's even jumps, you go from A to B, then B to A, and that's your two, then A to B and B to A, and that's your four. That's why we do it this way. If you are in a situation where you're on the wrong side and it happens to reduce early, well, we'll talk about that later. But essentially you can follow this chart, do two cold jumps, two hot jumps. If you are on the right side, if you are in the hole you want to be in and it reduces, go down to the second step. You've got now got the two cold and two hot jumps and that should close it off nicely. The to crit at the bottom is just to get it to a point where no one else is gonna want to jump through it if you just wanna leave the hole there just just not collapse it. Useful for hull control if you really want. Um, some people just close them off and deal with the whole K162 thing that I talked about earlier. Other people leave them crit because it's less likely anyone's gonna try and jump through. Beyond this, we then have the option of is the hull reduced? No. That means if you've started a hull from fresh, you think, and you do the full two cold jumps and the full two hot jumps, and it's still not reduced, you follow the no side of things. And you'll notice that these do all add up to even numbers, which means you kind of need to do the math if you're using more than one rolling ship. So for example, this particular on the yes line, or indeed on the no line, we could go with two ships going down the no line there to roll four hot jumps because we need it to be an even number in order to be out of the system then back in. We can do this with one ship because we can go out in, out in, or we can do it with two ships where both go out and both come in. And that's your four jumps, right? You can't do that with three ships. If you've got three Praxis and three of them jump out, only one of them's coming back. So you need to be careful of that kind of math when you're looking at getting this to work. And you can see the different types here, the 3000 gigajoules, 3300 gigajoules and all that on there. Most of the stuff you'll encounter will be the 2000. Most of the common ones for rolling at the 2000s, some of the 3000s. So it's nice and easy to work with there. We've already talked about the fact that wormholes can actually have a plus or minus 10% to their mass. This can sometimes screw with your math. And what happens if other people have been passing through and out and you just end up in a situation where you're on the wrong side of the wormhole, you're you know in the system you want to be in, but it's at critical. You know that if you jump it again, you could collapse the wormhole behind you and then you're stuck on the other side, which is what we definitely do not want. This is where a heavy interdiction cruiser can come in handy. Now I'm gonna showcase this here with the Onyx, but again, this can be done with any of the heavy interdiction cruisers for any of the different empires. Essentially, what we're gonna have here is a cruiser that is so teeny tiny that it shouldn't trigger the collapse of the wormhole as it jumps out of the system that you want to be in but then you can make it absolutely massive so that when you jump back in, it should collapse it behind you. I like to refer to this as threading a wormhole because it's like sewing a needle through it. And we do this thanks to how small the heavy interdiction cruisers are to start with. You can see here the Onyx is sitting on 30,800 tons. Very small ship to begin with. But if I simulate it, some crazy magic can happen here. So let's turn off the micro warp drive and turn on these little things at the top here. And suddenly, I'm all the way down to 790 tons. Not 7,000, 790 tons. 
That is tiny. That is frigate sized. And in fact, that is smaller than several of the frigates out there. What magical module did I just use? This is the Zero Point Entangler. Zero Point Mass Entanglers, or ZPMEs, are high slot modules that can only be fitted to heavy interdiction cruisers, and activating them shrinks your mass by 80% each. It does also mean you can't do anything much else, and this can only really be used in J-Space, and really only has much of a use in J-Space. But if, like me, you are constantly rolling holes, it's very important to have a ship fit with a load of these. You can put as many as you like on, to be fair. I tend to go with four, because then I can still have a cloak and uh, probes there, just on the off chance I do get stuck on the other side. The rest of the fit, though, entirely up to you. I've gone pretty much full tank on this. All you need are the four zero-point mass entanglers and a 500 mega newton compact micro warp drive. Same reason as we saw in the 300-200 battleship. This is so that we can make our mass, well, massive. If I turn off the zero point mass entanglers here in the simulation window and activate that micro warp drive, you'll see we're 130,800 tons. That should be enough to close a crit wormhole. And if it's not enough to close the crit, you can just make yourself super teeny tiny again, thread back through, and then jump back into the system you want to be in with that micro warp drive active again. This essentially allows you to close a hole that a battleship would be too terrified of jumping through because it's going to get stuck on the wrong side. And there you have it. That's basically everything you need to know about rolling wormholes. At this point, you should understand how the math works and how you actually collapse a wormhole, why it will close when a certain amount of mass has passed through it. You should understand what a 300-200 rolling battleship is, and hopefully also a heavy interdiction cruiser for threading wormholes as well, in order to close one if it happens to go crit behind you. Hopefully, with this knowledge, you should be armed with everything you need to know to successfully roll off any wormhole that you come across. I do recommend having some friends and some support with you rolling off wormholes. It's one of those risky activities that certain gankers will like to jump in and try their hand at killing your battleships. Or heck, you know, they might decide that they don't want the wormhole closed that you are trying to close. It happens. Fights can break out. So do make sure that you have safe points set up on both sides of the wormhole, somewhere that once you have jumped through, you can warp off to, maybe use a cloak just to keep yourself that little bit safer, wait out a polarization timer if you have to, or heck, just it's often faster to warp off to a safe turnaround and warp back than it is to slow boat even with the micro warp drive back to the whole entrance for a jump. If you do have any questions though, drop them in the comment section down below or come join the Cat Skull Discord. It's all linked in the description down below. Great way to meet people and ask questions about EVE Online in general. Again, Cat Skull does have a bit of a wormholing slant to it. So if you're looking for a wormhole incorporation, we are recruiting. You can come join the Discord, open up a ticket there and apply to join Cat Skull. Finally, if you're watching this as a new player, do make sure that you have clicked my referral link in the description of this video as well. Any account can use a referral link, it doesn't matter how old they are, you just have to have never used one before. You click it, you log into your account, and it will give you 1 million free skill points. Should be enough to give you a nice head start in your journey in EVE Online. And again, while you're down there, join the Casgold Discord and talk to us about how you're getting on. Thank you for watching, folks. Hope you have some good luck with this one. Th things do occasionally go wrong, like the math can be as close as you think, but there are times when it still just doesn't go quite your way. Good luck, happy sailing, and see you in New Eden.